there is a movement afoot to dismantle the world stereotypes of the African continent, at least in the media, and one man has made it his mission. I'm Furman Patterson, and Washington Full Circle starts right now. You often see it on the news, Africa as a place of violent conflict and famine, images that forge a global stereotype. But John Momo is fighting that image. His main weapon is a highly acclaimed TV empire called Channels Television, often called the Voice of Africa. John Momo, thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. I just want to start with the channel's television operation. How large is it and what's the reach of it and what's your role in that? Channel's television is a network of four stations um, and it covers the whole of Nigeria, West Africa and some parts of Africa. Um, we are free to air. We've been operating since uh, the past 20 years. Uh -huh. um, I am the chairman and chief executive and co-founder uh, of the station. Uh, the chief. <laughs> now tell me, um, how, do you, how, how do you and your uh, competitors stand up to government-run television, which I think is the case in Nigeria? Well, I'm fortunate to be uh, an ex-staff of the government station uh, as former news anchor and reporter and also editor. And, and so, in one word, you could say I, I, I know some of the tricks. <laughs> and so, uh, but what we did when we started channels was to move away from uh, the usual pattern of government news, reporting government news. And we, we try to focus on uh, not only government news, but also on people-oriented news and news that affect the people at all times. So in terms of competition, it doesn't really look as if we have one vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government stations. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't rest on ours, and, and we try as much as possible to, to stay ahead of them. And as far as your uh, so-called mission, um, what, what are the main causes for these negative stereotypes about, about Africa? Um, I think we have to look back at the, uh, the fundamentals, uh, which is the fact that uh, when the news agencies were set up in the, 18th, uh, uh, in the 1800s, uh, mm -hmm. they, you had the, the big three who were set up purely for economic interests. And so uh, at any point in time from them till now is the same old story. Uh, people will report from that perspective. Uh, they, it was a question of his master's voice. So if <laughs> there's a stereotype from, from any of the reporters working for, for the big agencies. And these are the agencies who supply most of the networks. Uh, and the area of globalization, it means that um, the big networks are covering, by this I mean Reuters, mm -hmm. AP and AFP, they cover the stories. Uh, they give them to the, the, the networks uh, who subscribe to them and so you have all the same story coming from these three sources and uh, there's a stereotype um, Africa is a dark continent land of war farming poverty and, and what have you so so it's not it's not su a surprise that that's stayed on for for this long but it's it's time to change the narrative we cannot continue like that uh, and, and how does that affect uh, the economy uh, in Africa? Do those negative images affect anything at all, or is it just that an image? Absolutely. It, 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 they do affect uh, all the reports that are negative affect the continent a great deal. The reason is that if something is happening in the north of Africa, uh, for instance, the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. and you lump Africa together as one country, uh, then a would-be investor would not be willing to go into, in, in, into that region. Right. And he thinks... You know, it's just like a place like Texas uh, or one, one, one country. Mm -hmm. um, and so take the Ebola uh, virus crisis, for instance, and the issue of terrorism, uh, which is a main concern in, in some parts of Africa. Um, it doesn't, it's not affecting the whole continent. And, and so Ebola is restricted to now about two countries, uh, but the reports seem to have given the impression that it's, it's ravaged the whole of Africa. So, the mining sector lost so many uh, investments that could have come their way. 
um, uh, a lot of investors who are willing to come into some parts of Africa had to hold back mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, even the FDIs for Nigeria had to stall for a while. So it, it's only re uh, reasonable for you to say, let me you know, take a look, uh, wait and, and see what's going to happen. And our problem uh, uh, is, and our query for a lot of the Western uh, networks uh, is that there are other sides to report. The successes, mm -hmm. um, the the human angle, how people were battling it, um, the the heroic heroic uh, positions taken by the hospitals and the doctors mm -hmm. to make sure that this is contained, and the government's efforts to make sure that the Ebola virus, uh, virus is contained. Well, give us an idea briefly of some of the things that you're doing in your mission to try to counter all of this. What we're doing, first of all, channels is um, it's a news and current affairs station. Mm -hmm. um, we our news is about 97 percent local news and we try to let the people know that Africa um, is, is a land of opportunity so in reports in Africa we also play up uh, the good side uh, every side has you know good and bad and ugly side for example uh, for example I mean if there are wars uh, you don't only report the wars mm -hmm. in a particular region you report how people are coping with the wars, and you also look at the other areas that are that have their normal day activities, you know, uh, going on. Uh, so it's not just war and poverty all over Africa. When networks come to Africa and they focus on the slums of Africa, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't presuppose that uh, there are no slums elsewhere in the world in the Western uh, Hemisphere. But you know, show the good sides as well. So we tend to want to show the good sides, mm -hmm. um, but also report on issues that are also bad. Uh, as a journalist, you must uh, touch on every aspect of we, a story. We have about uh, 30 seconds left, and I'm just going to ask you, what, what accomplishment are you most proud of that you've made so far with this? The fact that um, we are now the reference point in Nigeria. Eight out of 12 times we're a TV station of the year and we just recently been crowned uh, Africa as best TV. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Of course, there's much more to talk about, but I, I hope you'll come back sometime in the future. I'll be delighted to do that. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for having me. All right. Coming up, market madness in D.C. as two of the city's most popular food and arts markets compete. Washington Full Circle will be right back after this. Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. I'm Furman Patterson. Eastern Market on Capitol Hill has been around forever. It has even arisen from the ashes of a major fire to be restored as one of D.C.'s favorite marketplaces. But with the arrival of waves of new residents in the city, many within walking distance, Eastern Market is being discovered anew. Chris Sicatelli explores D.C.'s original food and arts market through fresh eyes. Nestled in the heart of the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington, D.C., is a unique public marketplace, a place where residents and tourists alike can shop, browse works of art, and other extraordinary pieces of design, taste a variety of foods, even add a dash of color to their wardrobe, all while experiencing some of the friendliest people in the city. Welcome to Eastern Market. Established in 1873, Eastern Market is a destination for thousands all year long. One of the first things you will notice about Eastern Market is a true sense of community. Friendly faces, warm smiles, quiet invention, rousing spirit. It's an idyllic setting. Inside the main hall is an aisle lined with cases of produce, fresh meat, and more. Beyond the glass are colorful rows of pastries and other treats that will make any sweet tooth surrender. There are bunches of flowers, fresh cuts of fish, and a sea of customers casually strolling to their own destinations. I'm lucky enough to meet Tarji and Nicole Irby, here to do some weekend browsing, shopping, and kind enough to talk about one of their favorite spots in the city. I like going through the little marketplace where you can find new clothes, yeah. and they always have a lot of something really new, unique all the time. So you'll find something here that you'll never find anywhere else. And over the years, it's just become a, uh, a 
marketplace and a meeting place for people of all different cultures of the city. It's, it's really the heartbeat of the city. And it's those kinds of things Barry Margison, director of Eastern Market, loves to hear. A really important part of it is the community. So the community of Eastern Market sellers and crafters uh, and, and then the community uh, right here at Eastern Market, the neighborhood and the relationship between all those people, the connections that people make when they come to Eastern Market. The plazas and surrounding streets around Eastern Market are all abuzz on the weekends here. Artists, woodworkers, jewelers, craftsmen, and more gather to sell their crafts and show off their amazing talents. For Susan Johnson, owner and creator of Lily Pad Designs, setting up shop is indeed a labor of love. Yeah, every weekend, I mean, this is my job. This is what I do for a living. It pays my bills. and. It's also my family. You know, these are some of the best people that I know, and um, there's just no place like this in the city. As I continue my Sunday journey taking in more sights, I soon meet John Kerr of John Kerr Pottery. He shares his thoughts on the allure of Eastern Market. Diversity here is just unprecedented in other markets. We've got artists, we've got various crafts, we've got stuff that is imported. It's a great variety. The main plaza consists of open-air shops and tent boutiques. You can find almost anything at the Eastern Market Flea Market, from pottery to artwork, jewelry to scarves, hats, wait a second, miniature trees? Yes, miniature trees. Sarah King of Mimosa Design creates and puts these amazing miniature pieces of nature together, neatly housed in stone pottery. Today's visit to Eastern Market comes to a close, but not without a smile upon my face. The sights, the sounds, the people, everything combined makes for a wonderful experience here. Rain or shine, all year round, Eastern Market is open Tuesdays through Sundays. And it's the perfect place to walk, talk, and discover with friends and loved ones. And don't forget to check out Eastern Market's Open Air Market, offering fresh produce every weekend. Eastern Market, truly a place where all of your senses will come alive. For Washington Full Circle, I'm Chris Ciccatelli. Well, hold on to your basket. A hip new marketplace across town is now giving Eastern Market a run for its money. There are lots of things to see, do, and taste at Union Market. Cecily Fernandez talks to just one of the many vendors about what's new and exciting at this new addition to the DC Marketplace. Furman, I'm here at the fabulous Union Market with so many amazing vendors, and one of them is the District Fishwife, and we are actually here with Fiona the Fishwife, thank you so much for joining me. First of all, tell me about the name. How'd you, well, how'd you come up with that? I mean, it's a known word, sort of more commonly used from Australia and in England, and it's archaic. So it was back from around the 18th century when women used to sell fish. So husbands would go out and they would catch fish and the wives would bring them down to the docks and sell them out of baskets. So it has two meanings. It's a woman who sells fish. That's me. You. <laughs> and it's also a woman who's prone to shouting, which that's you too. Can also be and me that's me. Someday, okay, so. most of us. Um, and tell me, um, have you always wanted to sell fish, or how did this how did this uh, venue come about? Uh, well, I mean, I've always had an interest in fishing. So both of my grandparents fished, uh, uh, grandfathers fished, and also my father. So from when I was really little, I've been fishing all my life. In fact, there's some nice shots of me fishing over there when I was a young child. And it's just something that we always did. My dad bred fish in our garage when I was growing up, and uh, so something I've just had a a big interest in and when my husband we were coming from Afghanistan and moving here and he said oh um, it's DC I was like we're close to the ocean there'll be plenty of places to get great fresh fish and then um, we moved here to northeast and there just really wasn't a lot of great places to get a ton of fresh fish so it was really you saw the potential for uh, potential market for, yes. for fresh fish great and and tell me a little bit about the process how do you get your how fresh are the fish at the fishwife <laughs> Pretty fresh. Um, so, you know, the fish in our case really has, you know, come out of the water either the day before, anywhere from the day before up to a few days before. And then um, we try and keep most of our product regional. So that's part of what we think about with sustainable and local is regional from that eastern seaboard. 90% uh, of our case you'll see is coming out of things, places like uh, New England down to the, all of the mid Atlantic, Florida's, North Carolina. And that's part of how we stay fresh doesn't travel far and it gets in our case. And then what's the response been so far? So it's been really great. We've had a lot of people I think who are really enjoying being able to get really good local fresh product. And we do a mean fish and chips. Okay, fish and chips. Okay, seafood lovers, you must stop in to the district fish wife. You will not be disappointed. Furman, back to you. 
Up next, tips on what to do and where to go in D.C. as our Living for the Weekend team share ideas on celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. Washington Full Circle will be right back after this. Washington Full Circle team is here once again to share their ideas about how to spend your weekend. And of course, this weekend is part of Hispanic Heritage Month. With us today is Tamika Felder and Valikia Newsom. Hi. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Uh, Valikia, what are some of the things to do this weekend during uh, Hispanic Heritage Month? I was going to say, so you mentioned Hispanic Heritage Month, and of course, you know, D.C. has a great, nice, you know, uh, an array of countries represented in the Hispanic uh, diaspora. Mm -hmm. So Good we've word. got, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got D.C. Public Libraries. I know, you know, we love free stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So D.C. Public Libraries has uh, an array, a series of events going on all across the city. You can pick a library and find something to do there. They've got um, readings, they've got skits, they've got plays, tutorials, activities all throughout the library system. And like I said, it's free. Um, they're recommending books based on Latin culture. Um, you, 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 things are in uh, uh, different languages, of course, so anybody can come. Like I said, it's free. They've got uh, activities ranging from readings for babies even. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> to 19 year olds, uh, people all over, just all different ages. Is, is this particular libraries or just libraries? Uh, Throughout libraries the city. throughout the city wow. so you can go find out just look online of course go to the library's website and look online and just find out something going on at a library in your neighborhood oh yeah. okay it's nice all right and free <laughs> <laughs> the free is the good thing <laughs> exactly. I, I like free i like free so what do you have up to me well we're full swing into things and so the congressional hispanic caucus you know they have a big event ah, every yes. year lots of dates and so you really can go on their website which is hhm.chi.org which mm -hmm. is for Hispanic Heritage Month activities specifically and they've got a whole host of events that are centered around policy that really educate, empower, and uplift Latinos. So it's a really good time, especially with the upcoming elections coming up, to really get in and see what, you know, specific things are on target for them for this upcoming election year. So it's a lot of great stuff on that website, a lot of history of kind of where, they're, where they've come and where Hispanic Americans are right now. Wow. All right, Valikia, what do you have up next? Now, you know that I like museums. Do you know I like downtown? Yes, we know you're a museum I do, girl. I am. So, Air and Space Museum, one of my favorite museums, actually, in the whole system. It is. I love I'm that place. I have to go to that one yeah. yet. Yeah. It's still on my list. I keep hearing museum. phenomenal things treat. about it. It it's is. A treat. So, they are joining in and celebrating His Hispanic Heritage Month um, with their Innovators in Air and Space series. Uh, it's September, I'm sorry, October 11th. Mm -hmm. It's uh, right downtown on the National Mall. It's part of their Family Day series at the museum, and they're going to have events that highlight the contributions of Latinos in air and space, which maybe people didn't realize, but there are lots of contributions mm -hmm. from, uh, you yeah. know, our, our Latino brothers and sisters <laughs> <laughs> in air and space. So they're going to have a DJ uh, playing a Latin flavored space theme music. I don't know what that would sound like, but yeah, it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that sounds like. Very but that's, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it's described. That. Yeah, that sounds really cool. You know I love music, too. Yes. So that probably is a treat. Plug for the sound. A exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hands-on activities, uh, talks by Latin leaders in air and space, and again, what? It's free. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of the things that's great about D.C. because a lot of, of free cities things. you go to, yeah. the yeah. museums, the museums have a cost uh, to get in. Yeah. There's a fee involved, but you, any day you can go down to any of the Smithsonian museums, any of the others, and go in free. Exactly, and it's a little off, off topic, but I was just talking to a friend. You all know that I went to school in Philadelphia. Yes, and, we do. And they have their zoo there, and I remember going there like, oh, I can go. No, it costs money. It's I'm like that in South Carolina, too. I'm a lot of places to you have I'm to pay. I love D.C. Yeah. 
that. I don't, yeah. Want to, yeah, I don't get it. But really, <laughs> sp speaking of like the Smithsonian and different museums too, I know we're focused on that particular event, but if you go to the Smithsonian website, there are lots of different activities right. that are happening exactly. yeah. during exactly. um, Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage, Heritage Month. Yeah. And this was one of the ones that really stood out exactly. to both of us that we thought would just be so much fun. And of course, I want to go there because I haven't been to. there exactly. yet. That's, that's one you need to go check yeah. out, definitely. Yeah. You know, one thing, I, I ride my bike throughout the city a lot, and going downtown, sometimes I'm riding along the mall, and I just think all the time, it's like we live here. People come from all over the world mm -hmm. to be in D.C. Yeah. Uh, to see some of these museums. They have to pay for it, of course, stay in hotels yeah. and travel here, but we can, any time of day, you know, go right go in right and see Go right in and see world-class exhibits. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. So, Valiki, you have anything else? Well, I know we had Lucky Strike. Yep. They're having, ah. and we love Lucky Strike. Sundays at 8 o'clock, you can go to Lucky Strike and take salsa lessons yeah. or just get your salsa ah. on. Yeah. And if you're too shy to salsa, don't worry. Yeah. You can bowl. Still bowl. Right. I you may be still bowling. Bowl. I know. I'm going to give it a try, and if I suck at it, I'm just going to go bowl. Yeah, so that's really a great thing, that's and they're doing one. it really on good Sundays, good. so it's not just a one-day right. affair. Yeah. You know? This, then you can go next right, time. Right, right. So, yeah. I mean, it sounds really fun, you know. Lucky Strike, you know, we featured it on Washington Full Circle before. Sure did. And, yeah. and done yeah. lots of things there. And it really is a fun place to be. Yeah, hang you out know, with your friends. know, centralized in yeah. the city. You know, the whole gallery place area is just really, it's really booming. wonderful. And they're constantly getting new stuff all the time. And, I mean, who knew? Salsa no. and bowling? And exactly. I mean, that's, <laughs> hey, maybe that's just what you need. When you go bowling, you need a dance. But but the quick question before we go, we run out of time, okay. is can you salsa? No. 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 Oh, come yeah. on, you can do it. I right. have two left feet. <laughs> I tried and I failed. One day I'm going to take lessons. Yeah. I hope you'll join. Maybe you'll go to the Lucky Strike. Exactly. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much for giving your tips today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you both. Thank you. Well, we've run out of time, uh, so that's why we have to say so long for now. For the Washington Full Circle team, I'm Furman Patterson, and we hope you have a great weekend. Be sure to join us again next time.